You're listening to the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT podcast. I'm your host and curator, Rabbi Avram Kivalevich, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Clear the aisles. The projectionist has smicha. Hi, I'm here with Yitzchak Kolokowski, and we're here to darshan about old movies and vintage TV. Uh, Yitzchak, it's going to be an all animated show tonight. Uh, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we mentioned, of course, uh, Sergeant Bilko, and it's tunish today. And I guess it's worthwhile. We, we are both very cartoonish characters. So, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, should met, I should mention that the Sergeant Bilko Museum, the, uh, the... Let's, I'm going to start us off with, um, you know, I think two super classics of animation. And they're so classic, it's like, that they couldn't even be made anymore. Uh, the amount of work that went into them, the the fact that everything was hand drawn, the cells, uh, the artistry, the 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 there was no uh, computer CGI. They didn't have the type of uh, technical wizardry that we have today, uh, or to recycle stuff from other places uh, with a click and a change. And you look at these uh, at, at these both of these films, which I'm going to put together. Um, and Disney's, uh, again, I'm going to leave out the first great Disney movie film, um, Snow White. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if Bambi, I think, came a little bit later, but Pinocchio. Let's talk about Pinocchio and Dumbo. Um, it, the, the beauty in Pinocchio has never been matched. Um, the, the colors... I, I don't know if you can get a great print of it. I'm sure that on streaming services, maybe on Disney Plus. But if you haven't seen it, you really need to see it in a big in a big way, and to marvel at the the incredible detail that was put into this. Clearly, a, a labor of love. It is a uh, everyone knows, of course, it's the story of 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 a little boy who isn't a little boy. <laughs> He's actually a puppet that was sort of created by an amazing uh, craftsman called Geppetto who carves out of wood this boy who is able somehow to talk. And he has, even though he's a puppet, he has a certain life energy that Geppetto was given him. Um, He's able to uh, go from the stage of non-life, but sort of life, to half-life by the gift of, uh, of of a fairy who comes in and is able to uh, eliminate his strings. He still basically has the body of a puppet, but he has the free will and the animation of a human being, of a little boy. And when Geppetto discovers this, this great miracle that the, the, that the blue fairy gives him, um, he begins his life as a boy. And as the blue fairy says, if he proves himself, as a little boy, as a child, as he proves himself and that he will not fall prey to all the uh, uh, Yetzir Horus, as we say, that the world has for children. And he earns, and, he, and, he, and especially remaining honest, especially if he remains honest and is true, he will get his wish to go to the next level where he'll be an actual human being. And that's the basic story. And then, of course, what happens is, is that um, he gets into a lot of misadventures. Now, the original Kaladi uh, Pinocchio, if you read some of the original Italian stories that have been translated, he was the biggest rascal in the world. He was not a uh, wide-eyed, uh, beautiful little child. He was the, the, the biggest troublemaker you could think of. Uh, he, he was, in the movie, though, uh, Disney whitewashes and changes the Pinocchio character. And the character instead is a character that is um, just innocent and ready to be taken advantage of. Um, and that was something that, you know, I'm sure Disney made sure was going to be the change. He didn't want to have a troublemaker kid. He didn't want Bart Simpson. What he wanted was a child that, was, was, that could go wrong, a child that was innocent and had a good heart, but that could be swayed by some pretty bad apples. And um, of course, um, I would say the scariest scene that's almost ever been put on film is, um, I don't know if I'm getting the name right because I didn't check on my, I think it's Lampley, is one of the other boys that 
is together with Pinocchio because what happens is they sort of get kidnapped by um, you know by a group of of um, you know of, of, of evil people and they go they come they're part of a carnival and um, there is the what happens is is that um, by by go, being evil and, and lying it seems like little boys turn into donkeys and um lampley who is like pinocchio's sort of like um, eddie haskell type friend i would say just as a reference there a kid who's a little bit you know a little bit sketchy but has a bigger yetzahara uh submits and becomes this bad boy and bad boys turn into donkeys and you see a transformation that is that is one of the scariest things of any film. I know it's like you're a, a horror aficionado. <laughs> you should check out that clip where it's clear as Lampley is talking to Pinocchio, he's becoming more and more donkey-like to the point that he loses his all his humanity and he's transformed magnificently in shadow. And then you can see him as as, as a donkey. It is, again, one of these things that if you see it, it it'll rip your kishkas out <laughs> when you see that happen. It's done so beautifully uh, and scary. And of course, Pinocchio himself was almost on the way. And this is one of the things that brings him back. Uh, again, you know, I, I, I have to say that uh, it, I have a lot of animus towards Walt Disney, but it wasn't animus that, that I had as a child. As a child, I thought he was the greatest thing because I used to watch him on Sunday nights and I used to see him on, you know, talk to me because that was the show that my parents, you know, knew I wanted to see, The Wonderful World of Color, which then became The Wonderful World of Disney. And then, and Walt would talk at the end of the show. Walt would, would talk to the kids and tell them what movies were coming up and he would talk about what's going on in Disneyland. I, I was too young to see the Mickey Mouse Club. My brother, though, grew up on it. My older brother was a big fan. So in our house, we loved Disney. And then when I discovered, of course, later that Disney had been um, not, Disney had a tremendous amount of animosity towards the studios and the Jewish heads of those studios. And supposedly, even in his hiring practices, uh, he was very against hiring Jews and he, he was mistrustful of them. So uh, it, was, it was hard for me to, to accept. Although again, he, he had an iron hand in his studio, how he ran it. That doesn't mean that the creators didn't, wasn't them. Disney liked to put his name over everything, uh, even though they did a lot of the work. But I, you know, th- th- there's still wafts over Disney's work. You know, it's, it's unfortunate, the stink of, of anti-Semitism. I think the, the same thing can be said about um, Roald Dahl. You know, Roald Dahl wrote, I, I, he wasn't a, I wasn't a fan of his when I was growing up, but his books, my children were. And, you know, people loved his books, uh, The Witches and the, um, you know, and, 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 and uh, even, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. These were all books that Roald Dahl wrote. And, of course, Roald Dahl also was a, a known anti-Semite. He wrote very screeds against Judaism. So it's hard. So it's hard for me as a rabbi to, in a way, push people towards Disney. But I think this is really something that, that you're not going to see uh, in any other place, which is really the magnificence of Pinocchio as a second feature and maybe even a deep one that has more depth to it because you know Pinocchio is sort of whitewashed about what does it mean to be a human being and to be a good person and to make the right choices Dumbo is about of course an elephant which was uh, put out a year later Uh, Dumbo is about misfits Dumbo is really about people that don't fit in Dumbo doesn't fit in uh, because of his because of his incredible um, ears because of the fact that he doesn't look like any of the other elephants. Um, the idea of being ostracized, the idea of being made fun of. Um, and of course, in the, in, in the story of Dumbo, Dumbo learns his self-worth. The only one he has love from is mother and his mother is brutalized. And um, you know, they're part of a big giant circus and Dumbo is the baby they're waiting for. But because of Dumbo, what they consider Dumbo's inadequacies, Dumbo and his mother are ridiculed. In fact, his mother trying to protect Dumbo is, is considered to be dangerous and they lock the mother away and you know and Dumbo gets turned into just a clown because that's all Dumbo is good for. Dumbo was so silly looking. The only thing Dumbo could do 
is, is be in the clown act. And this, to me, is so heartbreaking when you think about children who have to somehow, if they're overweight or if they have some sort of birth defect or whatever it is, that they have to somehow accept the role that cruel society gives for them. And the way Dumbo, of course, gets his vindication and the way he's able to come back is by a mouse that believes in him, this Timothy Q mouse, uh, sort of a Jiminy Cricket character, similar to the character that Pinocchio has as his conscience. But Timothy Mouse is really more of a guide to him. And he's sort of like a little smart alecky. Uh, he's very similar to, uh, uh, to Jerry, um, the mouse, and Tom and Jerry. Uh, and I know we're going to be talking about Hanna-Barbera soon, a little later. But, you know, Timothy Q. Mouse is sort of like a prototype of Jerry. And he pushes um, Dumbo to be the best he can be. And what's interesting, though, is that Dumbo's ascension to greatness is really spurred on by the crows because the crows are, you know, clearly they're black and they are black. <laughs> the crows are black and they are a group of, of black actors and they are side splitting. They are smart and savvy. And I have taught Dumbo when I was giving a class about African-American cinema and, and the African-American and American cinema. And we've, I, th- those sections have been, um, unfortunately vilified uh, by modern uh, critics as really you know, catering to the lowest stereotypes of Black people. But really, it's, they are the ones who find, uh, Dumbo finds a kindred spirit with them. The film is, in many ways recognizes that, that the underclass in society can band together and give each other strength. In 1941, the Blacks were very much segregated and very much looked down upon. And they were in the same state as, as the Dumbos. Of course, these free spirits, these crows, are able in a way to relate to Dumbo. And they are able to, to actually relish the discovery that Dumbo has something that no other of these animals have, that his, 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 his ears give him the ability when they're flapped to actually fly, which is, of course, what they do. And, um, you know, and uh, they actually, it's with the crows who, who the blacks in a way are able to give that person a, a sense of self-worth and to be brought back and to be considered even something greater than the others. And to actually realize that when you have something different, it might be something special, something magnificent. So in many ways, Dumbo, although it's quite a bit shorter than Pinocchio, and it doesn't really have the same complexity and horror, but I think in many ways, both of these two together are really something special. And to really relish it on a big screen, I think, is really worth it. And it's the type of thing I, I would say, if you're watching it with your kids, you could really, really fall into it. You don't have to think that you're wasting your time. You're really something, two works that I think are really, really, um, they will stand the test of time as magnificent works of art. So that's, that's my pick, Dumbo. And uh, we'll come back to one other pick later. Yitzhak, what do you got for me? Dumbo and Pinocchio, what do you got for me? Well, it's it's nothing quite as uh, as uh, as majestic or as highbrow as either of those, and those are really uh, great picks. They are they are you know wonderful wonderful films, and uh, you know I've heard I've heard different things about the rumors about about Disney. I've heard some people have uh, I've heard some Disney apologists who claim that that a lot of these. Uh, Claims of his anti-Semitism were were somewhat exaggerated, but I, you know, we, we, I, I, I'm not saying that to contradict you in any way, but maybe to try to, to give you know some hope that maybe you know, and and maybe that's what, all of that's wishful thinking, you know, and and then sometimes anyway. I think it's like you know when my Eisner took over the company, I'm saying, oh, you know, Disney's real, Disney's turning over in his grave, you know, there's the the guy who represents the mouse is really a Jew, you know, comes from uh, you know European parents, so you know, I. I, I don't know. Look, I, I'm yeah. just saying it, it's, yeah. It, you know, it, I, I sort of, I, I imagine his fingerprints over it. And yeah. and those were the fingerprints of, of someone who we know had an animosity towards Jews. But go ahead. The, 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 the rivals that were trying to to beat out Disney in a certain sense would were Fleischer brothers at that time, who I think actually started their career working with Disney, and then and, but they were also anti-Disney. You look in in the in the um, crafting of how they did it. The, you know, they came up with rotoscope, which w- meant you didn't need to have uh, hundreds of cartoonists laboriously working on each cell. 
right? What they did was they had the, um, they would film a person, like a, a live person, and then draw around the film. And this way, the, the animation uh, was sort of like a, a, they already had, in other words, the movement was already in the actual stills of the person that they were filming. They just needed to draw and, you know, draw uh, the contours around it in an animated style, which, which saved them a lot of money. The right. rotoscope. And also, it made, made the movements a lot more realistic because it's basing on, on actual human beings moving. It's almost like to, today the type of uh, the motion capture that they use today sure. for, for the, for the, it was, it was that same idea. Which, in a certain sense, Disney later uh, took some of that idea. You were talking about how you know they didn't have computers to to copy the the same movements over and over again. But they what they would often do is once they in in the uh, certainly the later Disney films, which I think were after Walt Disney already passed away, uh, what they would often do was take the same animation and use it. Uh, you know, t- as a model of how, you know, you can see in the Jungle Book and then some of the other uh, movies, how the the characters pretty much follow the same movements. And they, they right. I mean, that, you're videos. right. In the 60s, yeah. in the 60s, you're right. Jungle Book was the was the classic example of the Aristocats as well. These were films that um, relied on a much cheaper version of animation and the type of stuff that, um, uh, you know, <laughs> Also, the repeating backgrounds and other things that they did in order, which, which again, we're going to talk about television animation in a bit, but you know, everybody was trying to cut costs. And, you know, if someone who watches, if, if, Yitzchok, if you've seen Pinocchio and then you see The Jungle Book, you like to say, what? You know what I'm saying? You know, this is almost not a Disney movie. You know, right, you know not- like, look, 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 look how this looks. It, you know, it, the movements are jumpy. The, the the images are 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 not sharp at all, um, and you know you don't have any of that texture and lusciousness that you had, but which was I guess just an impossibility. But but you know the, the Fleischers, you know the Fleischers were constantly um, lampooning Disney. Um, you know they had a um, you know, there was one where um, uh, you know you can't talk about the Fleischers without mentioning the the queen of the Fleischer Studios, right, Betty Boop. Right, you know, Betty Boop was the ultimate uh, sex pot that everybody, you know, you know, she, you know, constantly she was a Mae West little, you know, ball of fire, you know, with her double entendres and you know, innocence, sweet innocence. But of course, you know, this is what everybody was looking for. You know, the the whore and the girl next door all wrapped up together, and you know, this is what the the Fleischers were giving people. And Betty Boop was not for kids. You know what I'm saying? Betty Boop was for she was a she was a pinup star. And uh, I think there's a, I think there is a, um, there is a, uh, uh, there is a, I think one of the flashes had something where Betty Boop gets, um, uh, I think it's called Bimbo's Initiation, uh, where uh, Betty, you know, the, Betty's dog is Bimbo. <laughs> I mean, she's a Bimbo, but sure, her dog is Bimbo. And I don't they, know if that, did that word have that meaning at that time? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> But she, it's trapped. She gets trapped in an underground labyrinth, uh, and who's there is a, is a demon mouse, which is yeah. um, which is obviously Mickey. You know, um, and again, they, they they hated the the sweetness and the and the you know the like what, what Disney was doing to fairy tales and other things like that. Um, in fact, I think they even um, they actually produced a Snow White, which was actually four years before Disney's. So. Um, well, they also right after you know, uh, with two years after Disney Snow White, they made a, a feature film of Gulliver's Travels, which was trying to take some of that uh, Disney type of a charm, and it didn't really do quite as well. That was you know because they were going away from their from their craft. Right, they, right, they were definitely they were the sort of like Warner Brothers, but uh, even more adult, I would say. In other words, Warner Brothers, the Warner Brothers cartoons were also in a way, you know, a lot of Disney cast off who were mad at Walt. And, you know, you can tell there's, you know, they were, you know, they were, there was, there was a lot of uh, uh, competition with the Warner Brothers. I think Fleischers were, they, they were really in a different league altogether. You know, they were, they, they were doing something different with animation, more inventive, uh, more in your face, more adult, 
in the Superman cartoons. I mean, the Fleischers somehow got the uh, they got the franchise to 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 draw uh, and and to, to, and to produce the adventures. I guess they were called the Adventures of Superman. Uh, I, I I've seen. I think I've seen all of those. And I don't, I don't quite remember. I think it was just Superman. I, maybe it's it called was Superman. A... It's called the Adventures of Superman. Yeah, and <laughs> very little plot, but they were those were great. I think um... I mean, they they had very interesting things that were unique, you know, and 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 new. You know, one of the things that I think is it's in a way like almost a forerunner to Godzilla. There was the Arctic Giant, which really looked like Godzilla and it was it was uh I think 11 years before Godzilla came out and uh and before and before the the beast from 20,000 fathoms or anything else that Godzilla would have been inspired by was already there in the in the in the Fleischer's Superman cartoon where you know they they find this this dinosaur under the ice which which is a spinning image of Godzilla. Just a, it's not a fire-breathing monster or anything, but it still was quite a, a interesting thing to find that you know that image of a the kaiju monster attacking a city and Superman being the one who who rescues the city from the monster. Uh, they also had a mad scientist who scientist character you know who was trying to attack the city with the you know, attack Metropolis with with uh, some kind of a death ray, and it, and the the way that this character looked looked very much like Nikola Tesla, and, and many people uh, you know claim that it was actually based on him. At that time, he was kind of seen as somewhat of a kook, and it's it's interesting when you know we were talking. I, I about thought it the, was. I think it's like they say that the the character was 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 Karloff's character in the Black Cat. That's what they said that they they tried to make him look like Karloff in that in that. But also, well, I don't think he looked like Karl. Well, maybe and Karloff and the Black Cat. Uh, maybe that 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 that's a, a bit of a stretch. I think it. I think he looked he looked very much like Nikola Tesla. Um, I know uh, Lugosi played a character named Armin Tesla, uh, one of the few vampires that looked. Mister, the two Jewish boys who created Superman. They felt yeah. that the, although there was Superman on the radio. Uh, at the, at that time, uh, Bud Collier, of course, was his voice. Bud Collier from To Tell the Truth, as you remember, um, <laughs> later on TV. But um, the uh, they were ecstatic about it. They thought this is what we trying to do in the comics. In other words, yeah. this the comic had come to life, and I, I don't think you had that type of feeling about animated superheroes until you had Batman the animated series. Which, uh, which I think was in the '90s, came out, um, and I think that, of course, is also rightly extolled as, a, as, as an amazing work of art. Um, but you're right, the Fleischer Superman is, is, is <laughs> you know, it's. I think each cartoon is about ten minutes or so, but uh, they yes, are, I think, yeah, they are. You definitely get the color and and like he really comes out of the comes out of the script and and. Um, th- there isn't uh, there isn't much tension, of course, but that's the way the comic books themselves were. You you couldn't really expect, you know, uh, you know unlike uh, Batman the animated series, which you know already had years of, of character buildup, and especially you had Frank Miller and uh, you know all the the characterizations and and hangups that Batman had were reflected in that show. You know, Superman of the Fleischers is sort of just bubblegum. It's just a lot of good fun and beautiful. A r- using of the rotoscope uh, method, but really using it in a way that the colors are just so uh, vivid and flashy, and it's cool. I mean, to see Superman's heat vision, to see Superman uh, get involved there. Um, I know Clark Kent also isn't isn't like a uh, Clark Kent looks pretty good too in that, as does yeah. So I think it's a uh, it's I worth. Mean, it's probably one of the most realistic cartoons of that time. You know where it's you know it's it's really presented very matter of fact. It's not it's not over the top that much. It's not you know and and there really weren't any other. I can't think of any other animated uh, superhero stories until maybe thirty years later or forty uh, twenty thirty years later. Whether you know the, I mean I think the 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 Superman started in nineteen thirty nine. 1940 thereabout it, it was there was a lot of world war ii 
uh, things, the Jappa tours and the uh, things like that in the in those Superman cartoons. But the uh, <coughs> where else did you see? Uh, you know, the superheroes were mostly you know you like you said on the radio or in the serials. You know, there and was, they looked there terrible was... in the serials. They looked like guys running around in their underwear. And yeah. <laughs> they... well, the super, in the Superman serial, they actually the way they got Superman to fly was by animating him. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> you know, but, but, and, but and I don't know were, were, were the Fleischers involved with that because it looks kind of similar type of animation, but it was. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it could definitely be. It's look, and I think the. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, Max and Dave. They, it's true, it was for kids, but there was a certain um, adult aspect that 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 you know Clark and Lois had. Um, you know, it, 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 they didn't fawn over you in a childish way. And, uh, you know, Superman wasn't, you know, be good kids or something like that. It was very much a, um, you know, it, it's, they, they brought a realism to it, which I think. Yeah, uh, it was very, very realistic and matter of fact. It wasn't, uh, you know, it was, and it wasn't, it wasn't uh, George Reeves' Superman either, you know, for, where where he was more the, you know, the, the uh, you know, the, you know, uh, truth, justice, and the American way, and it was very, you know, much more clean cut, much more uh, upbeat and positive, and and almost more cartoony. The the George Reeve Superman was almost more of a cartoon type character than the Fleischer Brothers Superman was. Yeah, if you could I, say that, yeah, I would say that, you know Fleischer Superman was sort of inscrutable in a way. You know, he had a sort of a little bit of sense of humor, but you know, they they didn't necessarily flesh out the personality of what would be to have you know Superman's abilities. But it was definitely, uh, you you can't in the history of animation you have to register the Fleischers, and that might be one of the greatest things that they did in terms of uh, in terms of the accomplishment, in terms of the accolades as well. Well, I think that's great. We got Disney, you got Fleischer. Let's move up a little bit. <laughs> through the years and talk about one of Warner Brothers um one of the people who had the greatest longevity in Warner Brothers was Chuck Jones and Chuck um was um of course the creator of of the Roadrunner and uh, Wile E. Coyote and many people will say that that is some of the most artistic beautiful imagery and cartoons as well those those empty old highways and where Roadrunner is running and they're somewhere out in the West. It's sort of a little bit like Crazy Cat in a way, you know, uh, Ignatz and, um, and and Crazy Cat is sort of similar in a way, I guess, to the Coyote and, and Roadrunner. Uh, and I think there might be actually uh, an influence there from George Harriman on Chuck Jones. But, you know, as the Disney cartoons basically started folding, you know, as television became so prominent and, it wasn't expected to to see cartoons when you went to the movies anymore. Uh, you know, when television started you know, becoming so popular, the idea of going out to the movies uh, and staying three hours, a double feature plus a cartoon uh, and a short, you know, that wasn't really uh, what was going on anymore, right? They didn't have that. So the, the, the movies were the movies and the cartoons sort of like closed down. Um, and of course the television, uh, various television outlets tried to mine and buy the cartoons and show them on Saturday mornings and other things in order for the cartoons to sort of like, you know, go back to go back into. Um... Yeah. So when we talk <laughs> made any more for films, um, you know, the idea of putting cartoons on tv seem to be a natural and of course uh, we, we talked about it in the past uh, when we talked about top cat but of course top cat was preceded uh, by bullwinkle and uh, the flintstones and the idea was that we could actually put this stuff in prime time and let's try to make it appealing enough to the adults that the children and the adults might want to watch it together now chuck jones on the other hand uh was not so involved in an ongoing series but he figured he could create specials, special type of, of, of films that would be animated that you could show at certain times, uh, similar to the Charlie Brown specials that are so famous. The one that I know you know very well, of course, is How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which was a Chuck Jones special. Uh, and I would say it was probably Karloff's last great thing that he did. 
<laughs> was 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 it was was playing the Grinch. I don't know if he did anything after that that was memorable, but I think that he was even won a Grammy for that. I think. All right. Well, that that I think was, and again, I remember seeing it when it when it first came out in 1966. Uh, so I saw it at the time, and of course, I didn't know who Boris Karloff was, but I was singing, you know, "You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch." Uh, and Chuck Jones was the was the um, uh, the studio. It was, it was his studio. He was in charge. He was executive. He was the producer. He put it all together. Um, about five years later since the Grinch, which was a Dr. Seuss product, and Ted Giesel was very happy with how the Grinch came out, um, how it had really expanded a lot of his original Christmas story. So they decided to go back to Giesel's original book, the challenge book, which of course was the cat in the hat. Now, Giesel, as you know, uh, Dr. Seuss was against the Ch- Dick and Jane primers. See, J- see, see Spot, see Dick, see Jane, Jane and Dick go to school. Um, people thought that was the way kids should learn how to read. Give them certain standard words, put it in the most prosaic, boring setting, and let them know those words, and then they become proficient. And of course, there was a, in the 40s and the 50s, uh, they were talking about juvenile delinquency and uh, illiteracy. People didn't like to read. The schools, kids are dropping out. So Giesel thought, Dr. Seuss thought, I can change this. I'll change it. I'll come up with a kid's primer. It only has, I think, 50 words, and I'll make a story out of it, and the kids will love it. They'll read it, and they'll be able to inculcate these words and know how to write them and spell them and read them. And that's how you have the story called The Cat in the Hat, which basically, he, it was a bet, a challenge, whether he could do that. I think the book came out in 1956 or 57, and it really started a whole, it made Giesel into an educator. Up until that time, he had been a, a cartoonist, a satirist, his books about Bartholomew Cubbins and others, uh, you know, these were sort of like, you know, more like uh, he was a classic children's storyteller, but not an educator. Um, and, even, and, even before that, he worked with, I think, with Warner Brothers to make World War II training films right. like Private Snafu. And, That's right. right. He had, and, and the cat in the cat posited him as a person who understood how kids need to learn. And after the cat and the cat, there was a whole series of books like, you know, uh, you know on, you know, pop on top and uh, some of the, you know, the, the proliferation of, of, of books that, that Seuss developed. And, you know, he, he was, he earned his doctor name, so to speak with the cat and the hat. Well, in 1971, I remember when this came out as well, it was March, 1971. There was a primetime special of the cat and the hat. And it finally reached animation. And, you know, I don't know if Boris Karloff would have been so happy, but here the main character was not voiced by one of the great Hollywood actors. It was voiced by uh, a Jewish kid out of Chicago, um, Alan Sherman. Alan Sherman, who, of course, uh, uh, had, had made a career of, he was sort of the weird Al Yankovic of his time, as you know. Um, he basically took popular songs and Judaize them, right? I don't know, I don't have all the facts of his life in front of me, but I know that for many years, way past his death, Alan Sherman was very, very popular in many, many Jewish homes as the, the fellow who was able to, um, you know, Matt, you know uh, Harry Belafonte's Matilda is my Zelda, um, you know, the, the streets of Laredo or the streets of Miami, um, you know, any of the popular songs, whether they came from movies or they were popular on the, uh, on the top 40, he was able to transform them into um, uh, images of what urban Jewish life was like uh, in the 50s and 60s. And he was very loved about that in, in terms of, uh, you know, he wasn't a great singer, and but you have to admire his guts. For some reason, Chuck Jones and company decided that Alan Sherman could be the voice of the cat. And I guess there was enough um, sense of, of, of turning the tables, of turning things all topsy-turvy in Alan Sherman's persona that they thought he fit as the cat. And I, I think he died about two years later. This was, I think, Alan Sherman's swan song was the cat. Now, unlike I don't, he's not credited with writing these songs, but the best part of The Cat in the Hat 
which is different than the book, of course, is that they turn it into a musical. What is the story, basically? You're bored. The kids are bored. They have nothing to do. Right? Uh, they have games. They have toys. Kids are bored. Kids aren't reading. What do we do to shake them up? It was really Dr. Seuss's idea. Kids need imagination. Kids need things that are turn things on top of their head. Kids need the possibility, like out of the inkwell type of stuff. And that's what the cat does. The cat does things that are beyond logic. He, and he's able to, by doing that, he's able to get people involved. He's able to get the kids animated. The kids care. The kids are fun. The kids are fun. They're singing. And in a way, he's teaching them stuff at the same time. Now, the cartoon itself has the weaknesses of the story. It's, uh, you know, they couldn't go that much further than the book. But it does have, to me, two reasons to watch the, the program, the two songs. You have Calculatus Eliminatus, which is, if you remember, the way the, the cat is trying to find his moss-covered, uh, three-petaled family gridunza, which is, he says, is lost. And he's teaching the kids a way to find stuff that's lost. And the way you do, of course, is by marking everything where it's, where it's not, right? Calculatus Eliminatus right, is the best friend that you got. Right? Calculatus Eliminatus is, by, is, to, is just to figure out where something isn't, then you'll figure out where something is. And by the discovering of what it isn't, by marking it up and having fun, you can eventually find the stuff. And meanwhile, you're not, <laughs> you're not under pressure and anxiety that you can't find your lost keys, but you're having fun doing that. And uh, Sherman does a great job singing that song. The other song, which is the one that I have a special love for, is where, you know, in the story based on the book, um, you know, Sue sets up an antagonist to the cat. The antagonist, as you remember, is the fish in the bowl. Normally, a fish in a bowl is the most boring, you know, little thing that's just swimming and has no world. Of course, this fish is different. This is Carlos Krunkelbein, who is actually um, a super intelligent fish that in a way is the surrogate parent. Although he's tiny and small, and just like a, I guess, a little sperm, so to speak, like, like the source cat is this id that is all over the place. And you have the battle between the fish and the cat, and the children are in the middle, because the, the, the fish represents just swirl in a circle, just do what you're supposed to do, child, be bored, and just sit there. Whereas the cat is about the possibilities, the wildkeit, the mess, and the, the fish turns to the cat, and I'm not sure if this is taken from the book or not. I have to look again, where he says, you're not a cat, you're not, a, and that's not a hat. Who ever heard of a cat that's six foot tall, right? And obviously, who heard, of a, who heard of a fish that's talking either, but clearly, this is not a cat. This is not your furry little Thomasina pussycat. This is a, a, a grotesque Dr. Seuss version of a cat. You're not a cat. And then he sings that he is a cat. And what they do is, and I, I, the reason it stuck with me is because my parents spoke Russian. And um, what they do is go through the word cat in the hat in every language. Of course, they start with cat and then French. And then, you know, you know, cat hat in French, chap chapeau. In Spanish, I'm a gato in a sombrero, right? <laughs> they even have, you know, you know, and in, in Germany, I have the katze in the wolf. Ja, du siehst a katze in hut. Ja, du siehst a katze hut. And of course, the kids get into it. And not only that, the the, the, the universality of these words and uh, uh, brings the fish into it. And the fish, instead of being the the, the no fun fish who just wants to uh, tone down everything, he eventually cracks. And he knows Russian, and he talks about the shapa and the shlapa. Of course, I used to hear my parents always talk about their shlapa. You know, my mother would always talk about my father's shlapa, which was his hat. And, you know, hearing about the shapa and that shlapa, um, and, you know, the cat goes into a whole Russian dance um, and, of course, falls down the stairs as he's doing it. Um, and it's just a, uh, a lot of fun um, to see that and to see Dr. Seuss we talked about Superman being brought to the screen finally. Uh, I think this was you know, a way that you could capture what Dr. Seuss was about. Um, and Chuck Jones, I think, was the guy to do it. Um, and Alan Sherman, I think, you know, he died a couple years later, but he had his role, <laughs> again, to be teamed forever as you know, the voice of the cat. By the way, when, the, you know, the cat and the hat and the, and the, um, uh, the two children and the fish um, 
PBS Kids and the CBC and others, they tried to revamp the series. I didn't see it, of course, but you might have when you were growing up. Uh, and uh, um, Dr. Seuss's widow wanted uh, the great Canadian comedian uh, Martin Short uh, to be the voice of the cat because she felt that Martin Short embodied the, the spirit of the cat. So I think Martin Short was, if you take a look at some of the cartoons available on YouTube, you can see Alan Sherman's Mamala Malka Martin Short, who not Jewish, but <laughs> very much has a lot of that great Jewish claim as well. So that's my last pick, the, uh, the cat in the hat. Uh, Hanna-Barbera were the other, you know, later on, they, even though they started already with MGM, like you mentioned with Tom and Jerry, already in the 40s, they really took off in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and so, you know, some of my favorite Hanna Barbera, probably uh, one that I, I was watching recently, was the uh, was the Pebbles and Bam Bam show. There were several spinoffs of the Flintstones. Uh, some of them were quite interesting, and that one uh, had Jay North as Bam Bam and and Sally Struthers as as uh, as Pebbles. And I met Jay North once, so that was, you know, that uh, at Monster Bash, it was the first Monster Bash we went to, Jay North was brothers, so then it leads to All in the Family, and there was another cartoon, which I haven't seen in a long time, I remember my, my mother was quite fond of it, and it was shown on cable, you know, obviously in rerun, that I can recall, probably sometime when, my, when I was a teenager in the 90s, uh, from the 1970s, was called uh, wait till your father gets home. And and when I was mentioning the realism of the Superman cartoons, nonetheless, you're talking about Superman. There's nothing realistic about, you know, an alien that, that uh, you know, that, that, that has all these superpowers. That, that's, that's not realistic. This, as, as far as I know, you know, until you get to, you know, things like King of the Hill in the 90s and others, this was the most realistic, uh, you know, sitcom type of uh, a situation as opposed to, yes, the, the Flintstones was, was a sitcom, you know, based somewhat on the Honeymooners type of uh, atmosphere, but they were, di- they were cavemen and, and, you know, with dinosaurs. And then, you know, you had the Jetsons, which was actually quite short lived. I didn't realize that most of the Jetsons cartoons that I grew up with were more contemporary to that time in the in the in the eighties. They were not the original nineteen sixties Jetsons. There was only a handful of the original series of the Jetsons. But this one, Wait Till Your Father Gets Home, was a real, you know, realistic um sitcom along the lines of what, what you were talking about last week of getting into the more gritty type of uh realistic urban or suburban type of sitcom this was more the suburban type but to get into something that was uh, true to life and uh, it had tom bosley was the father that's the only one that i really remember but i know we did some research and the others you know didn't have his big name as 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 tom bosley um but it's it really i think and that was before happy days uh, so he he already was was playing the father figure Long before Happy Days, right? But, but, but this was a father figure that wasn't as benign as his, no. his role in Happy Days, where he plays but, Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Cunningham is sort of all sort of wise, and this is more like you said, an Archie Bunker character. Right? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't David the Gnome either. I don't know if you know about David the Gnome. If that's a little <laughs> bit later, but Tom Bosley was was David the Gnome, who, who was the the epitome of wisdom. Uh, and and someone that something that I grew up with, you know, that was contemporary in my yeah. time. But I'm saying this was this was a character that was supposed to have edge to it. He was he just like you know cartoons tended to blunt the you know the gross aspect you know of of their real life counterparts. But you're right, based on what we read, the the subject matter had to do with adultery. It had to do with with protests against the war. It had to do with conspiracies uh, happening in the government. So, it, 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 like you say, it was, it was, it was. You wonder, you know, what was the advantage, really? It's like of putting it in, in a cartoon. In other words, the, the Flintstones, of course, you know, could do, uh, like as you say, caveman shtick, uh, because they could just have someone draw, you know, uh, all, all the caveman appliances that were, you know, <laughs> they could draw the the you know, the vacuum cleaner and whatever it was that, that you know uh, that was made out of a peridactyl. You you wonder what was the advantage of making it a cartoon when it was 
clearly mostly for adults, correct? No, oh, it was. It was. I would say strictly for adults. I, right. So, I think so you you have to wonder. Today we have Adult Swim, and we have you know, as you say, Family Guy, and and and, and other you know, King of the Hill, where you clearly have uh, adult characters, and and and, and there seems to be uh, a a following specifically because they are drawn and animated, as opposed to seeing live characters. What do you think is the reason why you know? It might be a cost cutting. Uh, it might be cheaper because you don't have to actually film people and and and, and take them into a studio. You can you know you you can do it all. Uh, you know after you draw it, you can then just have the voice actors coming in and then they match the voice to the uh, to and you the pay animation. the voice act- you pay voice actors a lot less than you pay live actors. And that's true. So yeah. do you think it was just a financial thing? I mean, there must have been something they felt that the kids who were watching cartoons in the fifties and 60s are growing up and maybe they can hit them with something like this that could be successful for them do you think that might might, might be it were these were people that that that's what they knew and they wanted to do something with what they knew which was animation uh but that was a little bit more gritty and realistic and it, uh, and it, it's interesting it, that it actually lasted i think um you know, it lasted two plus seasons. I think it was canceled after four, after in their third season, after four episodes. But they were able to get a lot of, uh, you know, talent. They were able to get, you know, Don Adams uh, guest starred on it, or Rich Little. A lot of the people that were considered, uh, Paul, you know, Paul Lynn, I think, had a recurring role in it as well. So you had yeah. a, uh, <laughs> you had a lot of people that were part of the television landscape. That I guess were you know that it was worth it for them to be part of uh, wait till your father gets home, but it, it might be hard to track down. But it, it's probably as you say a uh, you know I mean the Simpsons is in a way it's a, a, a creature of its own <coughs> type. It's not exactly realism, but it also isn't for kids only. I mean the Simpsons I think <coughs> Simpsons needs its own um, it, it, its own classification, but. Yeah. It, it, after the the Flintstones, which lasted four years, I believe, or maybe five years, uh, till The Simpsons, there was really no other program that made it. I know that I remember when I was a kid, I think, in, uh, I, I thought it was Hannah Barbera, but maybe it wasn't. <clears throat> there was a show called Where's Huddles. I don't know if you remember that show, Where's Huddles. I never heard of that one. About, it's got Fred Edelman in it is the voice and he's uh there it's about uh like i guess two football players i think it was about and i remember i liked it because it was football themed and i remember that show got canceled right away so there was a lot of uh, there were attempts to sort of like catch lightning in a bottle it again and you know wait till father comes home at least was able in a time before cable before many options was able to at least have enough of a of a following that it lasted uh into a complete second season and a little bit of a third. So it's probably worthwhile checking out again and and noting, as we said last week, about how some of those issues are still with us and maybe, you know, being done in a cartoon fashion, you know, does that, are you able to, uh, did they become more, uh, is it more soluble? Is it more easy? Or, or is it more palatable? To well, take? That's, that's what we see now. You know, we, we see all these cartoons that are pushing the envelope. I mean, they've been doing it for 20 years now. 30 years, you know, the Simpsons been on, on, you know, for over 30 years, but the other ones, the, the South Park and the Family Guy and all these others that, that have, you know, they're, they're very, you know, inappropriate. I, I didn't, I, I haven't watched a lot of those in a long time. The Simpsons, I still watch, but the, and even that has, you know, lost a lot of its luster and charm, but it's, uh, uh, I, 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 you know, it's, it's a different type of a world now, but at that time, and and still, but you don't really. Well, you know, I, you know. I, I think we should really point out here before we close. I mean, cartoons. Yeah. We're talking about Betty Boop. Betty Boop was really, in a way, a, a nod to many of the naughty, uh, you know, types of of of, of the use of of uh, of cartoon images, right? I mean, there's yeah. there uh, there's always been this underground, you know, crumb type of you know, right, right. as as pressed as you can get. And, you know, uh, I think that that's always ex- existed side by side with the squeaky clean Disney cartoons. Uh, there's always been these raunchy things you can always get. And I think, you, you know, you had them way back, you know, maybe even the turn of the century. So it's interesting. I think what happens is, is that there's something fantastic about using, 
you know, which should be playful figures and, 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 and should be sort of like childish. And then in a way, what comes out of it is really the most profane and, you know, adult and inappropriate stuff. There's some sort of uh, appeal to that, you know, miss and send that there's like, wow, like, you know, you know, is that what they just said? Right. Is that what that little boy just did? You know, is that really what happened? And I think there's, there's, there's that, I think it, 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 it titillates some aspect of the person's id uh, to be able to see, you know, these type of adult issues somehow spring forth in this like cartoon, it, fantastic it has way. To be, it has to be done in a way that 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 makes a point. I know I I I haven't seen it. I don't plan to see it, but I understand there. I guess there's there's the magic of the image, the fact that this image is something that it's not necessarily something that you see in nature. It's something that sprung from the mind of of an animator, and it really, in a way, harkens to, you know, a period before film. And, you know, we talked about film being, you know, the first movie I think we talked about was like, just like a, a train that was being filmed coming at you and people would just come into the theaters and, and watch this happen. And I think when you talk about animation, you really are in a way connecting to something that's, that's different than just a representation of reality. You're talking about something that's in a person's uh, artistry and imagination, something that really doesn't exist in the real world, or definitely something which which is a, an image of something that doesn't really exist. And yet, you invest it with something, and then you, if you if you use animation to make it come to life, there's a certain beauty and power that you are able to get there that you're not able to get from 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 as as deftly as ex- expertly as you film uh, people. There's something about animation that still has a power even uh you know even post uh toy story and computer animation there seems to be still something in 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 these drawings that people still are (laughs) are drawn to all right well that's it my friends um as we say I would say that's all, folks. (laughs) That's all, folks. You know, you know, you mentioned we mentioned. Watch your step on the way out. Be well. Thanks for joining us for another episode from the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a single episode. 